as well, episode 56 of my One Hong Kong Quest review series. Uh, uh, this week we'll be uh, looking at issue 56, uh, unsurprisingly. Um, <coughs> looks like it's going to be a good issue this week, but let's get to it. Um, it's another kind of multi bits and pieces issue when it comes to the models. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. Here we, go. <coughs> we can see what we've got here on here on the cover. You've got an ancient, you've got some lieutenants, um, and some standard primaris. So basically, another one of the uh, sprues from the Dark Imperium box set, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and that's the other one, the other ones I got. It means uh, I've got a lot of five man squads because I also actually have had the Dark Imperium box set, or at least half of it. Split it with my mate Carl. He took the Death Guard. I took the primaris. Don't know how uh, how valid running a ton of five man squads is over less ten man squads, but as always, fantastic um, detail in the models. Uh, got quite a few models this week. Uh, can't as I say, can't really put an exact price on it. You kind of got a squad of Primaris, a couple of sort of semi characters, and an ancient. Um, I know they they were doing sort of twenty odd pound box sets that gave you five Primaris when. It came out, but um, certainly you're making your money back on this particular on this particular issue. Seven ninety nine for a full squad of Primaris, two um, two lieutenants and a sergeant and a, and a Primaris ancient, which is what the banner bearers are now called. They're now called ancients. Um, worth noting, the reason they're called ancients is because. At the point we are now in 40k history, um, the Primaris have been around for a good couple of hundred years, so they are well and truly sort of worked into, into the chapters. It's also sort of worth noting that the evolution of the chapters hasn't stopped, because where Space Marines live, supposedly up to 400 years before showing any appreciable signs of ageing, uh, at least that's one of the backgrounds. There are others that say they age faster, there are others that say they barely age at all. Um, pick which one you want. Um, but if something lives for 400 years, then 200 years is not that much of its lifetime. Um, space moves are quite survivable um, in law, uh, yeah, really depending on what they go up against. So some chapters will still be mostly uh, standard marines. Others will probably now be mostly primaris marines, depending on how much battle damage they've taken. And whilst there is a lot of fighting, there are also now a lot of marines and a lot of imperial guard. So a lot of it is spread out. And supposedly, with Gilliman being a genius, um, <clears throat> he's probably keeping his losses to a minimum. Um, we've also got the bases. As you can see we've got uh, five standard size bases of standard marines. <clears throat> one for each of the lieutenants, lieutenants, uh, we call it, and one for the ancient. Uh, the ancient goes on a bigger base. Um, also supposed to get any ancient rules in here, so let's uh, dive in and see what we've got. Okay, as always, signed by Iren, Ian, our, Iren, Ian, our spiritual liege, and straight in here <coughs> to Primaris Ancients. <coughs> um, where each Space Marine chapter contains a group of veterans known as Chapter and Company Command. These experienced Space Marines are often tasked with providing bodyguard for the chapter's leaders. They may also be deployed as elite. Forces to reinforce uh, crucial se crucial sections. Um, if you ever read, a, there's a guy called Sun Tzu. If you get a chance to read the little abridged version of his book, it's quite good. Um, if you want to read the full version of Sun Tzu, you'd need to learn ancient Chinese and go to China. I don't think they've ever feel they've ever printed the entire thing because it's like it's like the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. He, he wrote a lot of stuff, plus a lot of it was written by people claiming that it was written by him afterwards. And throughout the centuries, I don't think they know which ones were written by Sun Tzu, which stuff's attributed to Sun Tzu, which stuff stuff that Sun Tzu supposedly said, or he definitely said, and so on and so forth. But um, the book talks about what's called ordinary forces and extraordinary forces. <clears throat> In this case, your ordinary forces would be your basic space marines um, and your space marine primaris. So your extraordinary forces would be things like your command groups and that that you can move around to make um, a massive difference to the battle whilst only having small numbers. Uh, it's worth it's worth considering a lot of these extraordinary forces because you know, your, your veterans, your uh, ancients, 
your lieutenants all have an effect on your other basic guys, giving them rerolls, giving them buffs, and things like that, which really can, if used wisely, swing a battle in your favour. Being able to, you know, having a guy within so many inches of your lieutenant and being able to reroll uh, ones or something like that, um, or <coughs> or yeah, some of them have reroll leadership, some of them have reroll failed shoot rolls. You know, those. Those skills that come free with the characters in the Primaris and in basically 8th Ed can really uh, improve your accuracy um, with things like that and uh, avoid certain calamities if used properly. Um, so the, um, the Primaris Ancient is another one of those. We'll get to the specific rules in a minute, but it, I believe it does involve uh, a buffing. Um, where are we? Uh, they may also be employed as elite force to reinforce crucial sections in the line um, or break through enemy's defences. Some of these specialist warriors have the honour of bearing the chapter's banner into battle. In most chapters, warriors who are given this task are referred to as ancients. <laughs> hence the term Primaris Ancient. Um, it's usually also an older warrior, hence the term ancient, who's given this because he's spent years and earned the right uh, to carry the banner. It's a bit of an archaic thing when you think about sort of high-tech warfare, particularly today. We don't have anybody wandering around with massive banners um, or massive giant targets to shoot at. But um, that's kind of the joy of the 40k universe. It combines um, sort of old-world anachronistic stuff with sci-fi future. So you get extra bits and pieces. Um, company agents carry the battle flag of the company they serve in. Each of these bath, uh, banners is an ancient relic steeped in history, heavy with the glory of their chapter. Um, so, you got to remember. Uh, <clears throat> so these banners are massively important. Um, most of them come with basic banner on them. With this, um, it's not specifically anything, but you can see from the detail it is very. It's ultramarine esque in style, um, working equally well with. Um, Imperial Fists, sorry, their successor chapters. Not very Space wolf -y, but um, the Space Wolf packs come with a lot of banners anyway, so I'm sure with a little work you could replace that or convert that into something different. Um, <clears throat> or make one from scratch, even, yeah, depending on how you fancy and what your modeling skills are like. <clears throat> yeah, Ancient trusted never to let the banner out of their grip while they still draw breath. To do so would leave a mark of terrible dishonour and shame upon them. So no matter what they're doing, they've got to hoik it around with them. <clears throat> Next, we move on to Ultramarine's chapter organisation. Uh, this is always something I've been a little bit curious of, um, because Ultramarines now have a chapter master who is in charge of the chapter, and a Primarch who is obviously in charge of the chapter as well. So <clears throat> it'll be interesting to see how that works. Um, the Ultramarines are the most codex compliant chapter, for it was their Primarch, Rebute Gilliman, who penned the Codex of Stratus itself and then said, don't bother using it, it's just guidelines. Um, they operate 10 companies as laid out by Gilliam in the Codex of Stratus. Warriors from each company can be identified on the battlefield by their coloured armour. Um, it's worth noting that if, and I've actually done this once because it looked a bit odd, if you actually <coughs> listen to the general outline of the, comp the, the um, chapter, they go, oh, it's 10 companies, 100 people per company and 1,000 Marines. If you actually start counting all the extra marines they use, it's about 1,400. So there's about 400 supernumerary marines, uh, including people like your, uh, you know, every 10-man squad gets a rhino or a land raider. So there's 12 men, there's 12 marines assigned to that squad because there's two marines riding each vehicle, supposedly. Um, one driver, one gunner, and in the case of the land raider, one machine spirit. Um... In those numbers, they don't include dreadnoughts. Um, so if you count a dreadnought as a marine, which I kind of do, um, you've got those guys in the chapter as well. You've got the command company in the, you know, the command squad in the chapter. Um, there are marines. If you read the law, there are marines in the ships. <clears throat> so each each ship will probably have a marine captain at the very least because they're marine ships. You know, they, you know you're just talking sort of the battle barges. And the um, the bigger ships, the uh, marine ships, obviously they've got uh, human control ships assigned to them. Um, then you've got um, the guys driving the um, the land raiders, the devastators. You've got the guys riding the land speeders, and so on and so forth. 
Um, <clears throat> so when, when you start adding all these numbers together, it comes up to about 10,000 battle-ready Marines. And then, you know, uh, this was just going from, I think it was a 7th Ed, one that I actually sat down and counted. But the 7th Ed one had the entire chapter laid out, and it worked out to about 400 extra Marines, because <laughs> there were that many extra guys in it. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right one, but you know, literally just sort of sat down, uh, counted everybody, added everybody, um, as I say, you know, you, you had the um, Devastator Squads, which were smaller, but they tended to have more of the Devastator Squads to bring the chapter uh, numbers up to four, up to 100 people in the uh, company, sorry. And, um, yeah, there's just, there's a lot of extra Marines in there, just hither and yon. Um, as I say, yeah, the basic squads came up to about 200. The Devastator chapters, the Devastator companies which were your heavy weapon specialists tend to have more because they included more devastators in to bring the numbers up to 100 on the picture. And then each of the devastators squads, which were either five or 10 man squads, depending, came with another rhino, or if it was a smaller squad, which sometimes they were, it would come with a Razorback, but that Razor... So you've got potentially five Marines with two extra guys in each squad because there's two guys driving the Razorback, one gunner and one shooter that's why the razorback that's why when the razorback drops off it's devastated what it can continue driving around so um so take the organization of the chapter in these things with a pinch of salt it varies um depending on which iteration you're reading and who's written it and also there's extra things which they always seem to forget to count and in addition to that it, that is what the chapter should be at full strength. Sometimes it will be stronger because the chapter is at full strength, but they're also recruiting more Marines. So they'll have more guys in the in the scout company, either just in the course of things because they haven't lost any, they've done rather well in battles and they're just a little heavy, or because they're specifically expanding their chapter in preference for a found in preparation for a founding. And that happens quite regularly as well. Um, it's a rare thing for in, per individual chapter to split up into two chapters and have a new founding. But across the Imperium, it happens reasonably regularly because there are always chapters that you know, perhaps get a bit too large and need splitting up. Or there are often, um, you know, and there are always incidents which require, sorry, just storm trouser, which require more Marine chapters. So the Imperium will go, right, we're doing a whole big founding. You know, everyone bulk up their numbers. Yeah, so add to that, and even some of the ones that supposedly are Codex adherent chapters can get heavy. <clears throat> That's before you start looking at some of the other ones. Either that, or if they've taken uh, heavy losses, um, such as the Crimson Fists um, at Ringsworld, they will be a smaller chapter because it takes a long time to recoup numbers. Okay, anyway, we're going through this. Um, sorry, random aside. Uh, why is each company identified by the colour trim? Since Robert Gillings' miraculous return, some minor changes have been made. The tenth company now contains a large reserve uh, force of 100 Vanguard Space Marines. These warriors were especially trained to undertake the most dangerous missions of reconnaissance and assassination missions. These minor changes <coughs> have been... Sorry, where are we? These minor changes have been reflected, reflected in the Codex Astartes, which is being altered by Rebuta Gilliman as his tactics are updated and modified. That's a thing as well. Previously, it was kind of considered a holy text, thou shalt not change the, uh, the Codex. Now that Gilliman's back, it is being considered what most other, what a lot of the other chapters consider, which is more guidelines than actual rules. So that's pretty cool. Um, we've got Gilliman here, Mighty Warrior Master Strategies Without Compare. Robert Gilliam is the prime of the Ultramarines. After a thousand years of stasis at the brink of death, he has returned to his duties. Uh, the Ultramarines fight with greater fury than ever, encouraged by the beloved leader. And then we move on to Marnius Kaldar, who is one of the oldest Marines to receive the, the uh, primaris treatment. <clears throat> I was going to say it nearly killed him, but in fact it did kill him, and then they brought him back, and then it killed him again, and they brought him back. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it basically killed him, um, but they were able to revive him after a long battle so he's one of the oldest marines ever to be upgraded to primark but as it's part of his beloved leader's vision he's called cool to do it 
uh, not Primark, to Primaris, as it's a, but yeah, as it's a Gilliman's vision, he's happy to do it. And addition, and in addition to that, I think he wants to be an example to a lot of the older ones, saying, no, no, embrace this new thing. It will make us faster and stronger and better able to do our job. Um, during the Primark's absence, the burden of leadership fell to the chapter master, Marnius Calgar. Led, <coughs> yeah, sorry. No, oh, chapter master, full stop. Marius Calgar led the Ultramarines for centuries, guiding through some of the most devastating events in their history. Despite the return of his Primarch, his leadership is still required in the many wars to come. Yeah, he can't be ever, yeah. Gilliman, despite being superhuman, can't be everywhere at once. Having, um, having an experienced battle leader <coughs> is going to be awesome. It's going to be something he's going to have to use a lot. Um... It happens in chapters anyway, uh, it even happens in companies, hence the company, you get um, what's known as battle companies, which are 40 to 50 marines off doing one thing, led by the captain, and you get the other battle company, which are another 40 to 50 marines off doing something else, led by a lieutenant, simply because marines are a unique and extraordinary force. Most battles in the Imperial were fought by the Imperial Guard, and the marines will turn up to turn the tide, to do elite missions, or to break the backs of armies and you often don't need to deploy an entire chapter for most battles 50 superhuman badasses is enough to turn crucial battles which will then allow the imperial guard to carry the day you know so <clears throat> with an entire chapter of a thousand marines it's easily seeable that 500 could be going here or another 500 go there or because gilliman commands the entire empire he could take three or four chapters from other things um to one place and then leave the Ultramarines in the command of the guy who's been their leader for probably as long as any of them have known um, to go and do something else. So <clears throat> despite the fact he's technically not uh, the chapter leader anymore, he's prob it's very rare he would have led the entire chapter anyway. A lot of that, even when he was in charge, he would have delegated other stuff to other captains. Um, so he's he's technically still, you know, he's still probably doing pretty much exactly the same. The only difference being he's now the most trusted of his Primarch, which no leader has been for thousands of years. But he's not the de facto final leader. So little up, little down. But being as they also made him extra, extra Marini, um, I should imagine he's not too unhappy about it. Certainly there hasn't been any hints of unhappiness, but I'm sure that... As other Primarchs return, we might see some, we might see some traitors. We might see some guys turning away from their Primarchs out of anger and jealousy. Um, we're looking at you, Dark Angels. We're looking at you. Um, <laughs> and then it goes on to various um, positions at the Armory. Um, the Master of the Forge receives the Chapter's Armory. He and his Tech Marines look after the their vehicles, weaponry, and other machinery. Yeah, that was another group of people that are supernumerary to that thousand, the Tech Marines. Um, you've got to have a bunch of those. Yeah, you've got to have at least one full tech marine for each chapter, um, and then you have the um, the master of the forge as well. So that's you know another 11, 10, 11 marines out there. Uh, the apothecarium again, another supernumerary set of guys. Um, apothecarians main duty is to look after the chapter's gene seed. They are led by a chief apothecary, and a single apothecary is attached to each company. So again, bare minimum, another eleven marines in that and every company also has its own command squad with its captain some lieutenants an ancient another guy so a hundred man squad is in fact a hundred a hundred man you can see already how a, a chap i'll try that again a company of a hundred marines suddenly becomes 120 marines if you include all the vehicles and then 125 marines at least if you include things like you've got your captain your two lieutenants an apothecary tech marine um then you know you've got your recluse yeah you know, your uh your pre your, your my brain's out there um my brain keeps saying wound priest because i'm a space player but you know your room priest or your reclusiums and that um master of the sanct yeah you guess you get a reclusium who is the master uh the reclusium is led by the master of sanctity Orton cassius each of the 10 companies has a chaplain there you go your chaplain uh as a part of their company's command structure. So again, that, that's six guys on top of the hundred straight there before you include, as I say, the drivers and things like that. 
So you can see how the Thousand Marines quickly becomes actually substantially more. But, you know, it, it takes an army to feed an army, as they say. Um, uh, librarians, again, another thing added there. Uh, Chief Librarian uh, Varro Tigurus, Tigurius heads up the Librarius. His librarians look after the collective history of the chapter and act as battlefield psychers. So each each company may have a psyker, and then you've got an additional psyker on top of that. It's another six marines. But where they're training and constantly um, wearing out or dying, because the you know, being a psyker is harsh, you may have less. I suspect you probably often have more because to become a, a psyker is a very long, laborious, and dangerous process. Um, to become a marine is a long, laborious, and dangerous process. To become a marine psyker is two long, laborious, and dangerous processes side by side. So just to maintain, just to maintain six. Let's just say you want to maintain six uh, librarians. Sorry, six, uh, eleven librarians. Even sorry, um, for the chapter. You know, one for each company and one to oversee. You probably got to have twenty librarians in training at any given time, um, and many of those will make it through the training. Many of those won't. So you're going to have spare librarians on top of that. Um, so again, even within the Ultramarine, so it says are the most com chapter compliant company. You're going to have a lot of variants. So <clears throat> when reading this. Remember, it is guidelines more than actual rules, um, and the rules don't quite match up with what, you know, with the, uh, the sort of the general principle you keep hearing, which is a thousand marines in a chapter. So, <clears throat> even if you're playing ultramarines, don't hold. You don't have to hold exactly to these rules. Um, people are seconded to chapters. Not everyone has to have the same color shoulder trim. You might have uh, <clears throat> the first chapter has the veterans and the terminators. Certainly, you'll have guys from the first chapter in the second chapter, in the third chapter, in the fourth chapter, um, during battle as they get divided up. Um, some of the chapters are tactical, some of the chapters are heavy weapon squads uh, specific. So again, the, you know, got, you, you know a, a battle force will grab the bulk of one chapter and then bits and pieces from other chapters. So when you're building your army, this is absolutely fluid and it's just a, sort of a general thing of this is how they work. Uh, in totalis and in theory, rather than this is what you're going to see on the battlefield, which be can be completely different. But we go through here, we got to the uh, <coughs> the second company, um, <coughs> led by Captain Archer Archeran. Um, are considered the foremost of the battle companies, they have a reputation for reckless heroics um, that has seen them disciplined by their chapter master several times. The third company are renowned for the battles against Tyranids. So again, you can see that Already the companies to start. We, we're we're three companies in and already we're starting to vary because we're going to have specialisations. Warriors of the fourth company are called upon to garrison many of the major fortifications. The fifth company um, rarely fights together as one. Their warriors are often sent out on missions throughout the galaxy. <clears throat> Again, the sixth company, the first res of the reserve companies. <clears throat> That's another thing as well. In order to maintain company size, the Space Marines, uh, the Ultramarines have reserve companies. So they've got their more, four main companies, and then they've got the reserve companies, which can be deployed as a company by themselves, but are often used to keep the numbers of the main companies up to full strength so that the main companies can continually fight. So again, you get reserve companies. Um, <clears throat> the Sith Company Specialists in Mounted Combat, um, surging into battle aboard bikes and crewing many of the chapters, tanks, vehicles, their forces often part as Fight as part of vast tank formations. So with those ones particularly, they're specialists, so they will get broken up. Their bikers will be assigned, their vehicle riders will be assigned to various other companies if they need to. This, um, <clears throat> in case you're wondering, they're orange. We've got, uh, I believe that's meant to be gold. Uh, red, green, black, orange, uh, pink, possibly purple. Uh, Grey, again, possibly silver. Uh, light blue and... Um, I think that's meant to be white, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but anyway, the seventh company, 
is the company that an Ultramarine warrior gets his first chance to fight as part of a battle on squad. The Space Smithers company will also learn how to pilot many of the aircraft used by the Ultramarine chapter. So again, this is the company that most Marines go into straight away and they'll do a lot of fighting, but you know, the, the very statement that this is the company they first get to fight in as part of a battle line squad indicates that this company then later, people, Marines from this company can then later get taken off assigned to other companies. The eighth company are known as the Honor Blades. Here are Space Marines that are fight in close support. So again, we've got close, we've got close support companies. And again, it's worth noting the Marine doesn't stay in the same role his entire life. They move them around so that they're as adapted and well-rounded as they can possibly be because you never know what you're going to get stuck doing as a Marine. There's no point being an assault specialist if you're stuck in some sort of giant trench warfare and you can't get across a no man's land. That There's no point... <clears throat> There's no point being heavy weapons if you're fighting in close quarter tunnel combat and any heavy, we any heavy weapon you use could bring the whole thing down on your head. So the Marines are, yeah, the Marines are adapted to all forms of combat. In the Space Wars, for example, the young Marines are close weapons, middle-aged Marines are tactical and old Marines are heavy weapons. And then they, and sometimes they get divided out to specialists from those er areas. But it does mean that most Marines in the Space Wars chapter passed through each stage at one point in their career. <sighs> With the kind of the final stage or their final form, if you like, being Wolfguard. And it's a sort of similar thing to this. You pass through various stages. You know, you may go off and do specialists. You may stay there if you're particularly good at it. But the ultimate, the ultimate aim is to end up as a, as a veteran uh, or a Vanguard Marine in that first company because that's the badass company that gets to fight next to the Primark or the chapter master depending. <clears throat> Ninth company rarely fights as a single force it is there all to provide heavy support so you can see you got heavy weapons company there. Uh, to the battle companies they're equipped to undertake devastating long-range barrages and utterly destroy their targets and the tenth company is where every space marine learns his craft that's the scout company that's where all the baby diddy marines go um, they fight in the scout company um, and again, because they're scouts and because every chapter is going to need reconnaissance and scouts, they get divided up primarily into other chapters. Um, it's, uh, you know, the 10th company also contains uh, Vanguard Marine Elite Commandos. So it's going to be very rare, again, that the 10th company fights as an entire company because that's not what they do. So it does... It gives you a lot of variance and a lot of freedom to do what you want within even the strictest codex, which is one of the clever things about the codex is they've gone, here is this wholly non-variable order, but you can completely ignore it while still, and play what you want while still playing within this, you know, almost sacrosanct tome of strategy. Um, of course, now they've got the guy who wrote it back. It's a little less sacrosanct. There's, you know, so, Behold the chair of Gulliman. Behold where my ass sits. Yeah, you know, kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> you've got here a nice little story, Raise the Banner High, which is a nice Grey Knight story. Um, Grey Knights are a weird chapter. They're not technically a chapter created by the Emperor. Um, they're not officially a chapter at all. Officially, they don't exist. Um, but they are the Demon Hunters. They're attached to the Order of Malleus, the Inquisition Demon Hunter Order. And... Um, they're made up of a lot of varying gene seeds, um, but supposedly they're primarily made up of <coughs> uh, the loyalist remains of the traitor legions. Um, the flight of the yeah, when the Le when the legions betrayed the emperor, there were a lot of um, marines who were absolutely loyal and refused to betray the emperor, uh, particularly the older marines who'd served in, originally under the emperor. A lot of those guys were more loyal to the Emperor than they were to their Primarchs because they'd spent the first half of the Crusade fighting directly under his instructions. Um, there's a book called The Flight to the Eisenstein, which uh, catalogs a lot of them fight, uh, flying back back from uh, the Istvan drop site massacre uh, to Terra or to a place where they could transmit a message to Terra to warn the Imperium that they'd been betrayed. So um, those guys, for a start, supposedly were taken aside by Malkador the Sigilite, who is one of the Emperor's chief lieutenants and the most powerful psyker ever to have existed, who wasn't the Emperor, you know. It's like the second most powerful psyker ever to have existed, but the Emperor was something special as well. Whereas Malkador was 
the Emperor was massively powerful, supposedly on his base level, even more, still much more powerful than Malkador. And then there are, there are, um, there are various rumours about him tricking the Chaos Gods and him doing various other things, gaining Eldar artifacts and whatever to basically take his power to near God level <coughs> so that he could then bring humanity out of the darkness. <coughs> um, whether or not that's true, a lot of it is up to you to believe because a lot of it comes down to this is what the Chaos Gods have said in this novel, but it's not necessarily what the Empress said uh, and it's not necessarily what some of the other novels have said. Um, you know, the Chaos Gods could be telling the truth because they delight in telling the truth when it serves their purpose. Or they could be lying because they'll quite happily lie about things when it serves their purpose. So how that wears out, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody really does, except possibly some guy locked in a basement in GW chained to a wall where he's not allowed to reveal the truth to anyone. Um, and really, are we sure we've seen Jervis Johnson recently? Um, but on top of <laughs> uh, But yeah, uh, Malcolm the Sigil, like, Basically, who who knew about chaos and knew about that stuff all the time took the um, the surviving marines aside, including um, surviving members of Death Guard, surviving members of the Empress' Children, even surviving members of the Lunar Wolves who remained loyal, and formed them into a you know a unique demon hunting force because they already knew about demons. Supposedly, it's from their gene seed and other select gene seeds that the Great Knights were created, and their gene seeds are kind of mixed up to work together. And the Grey Knight chapter, which you know, which is maybe a thousand strong, maybe a lot less, maybe a lot more, you don't know because the secrecy of the Inquisition, is made up of a bunch of exceptionally powerful Marines, all of whom were created from human psychers, all of whom have been have had their bodies basically um, branded with anti with every anti chaos ward and every protective um, <coughs> hexagraphic ward imaginable, and in addition to that. After most missions, they have their minds wiped. So, yes, they have sort of personalities. And it's often interesting to watch those personality quirks grow. But they very rarely remember things because it stops them being open to chaos. You know, their minds are wiped. They're refilled with a basically a loyalist uh, template. And they act, they act uh, as the utterly loyal, incorruptible uh, Marines. Um, each one of them being a psyker. Each one of them be able to push stuff out, so yeah, push out basic psychic powers. Um, even if they're not by themselves able to do any psychic thing, they can usually do it in their squads. Um, <clears throat> but their psychic ability is there and is trained specifically at keeping demons out rather than letting them in, um, leading to the fact that, as a point of honor, no Grey Knight has ever fallen to chaos, technically, officially, supposedly. <clears throat> but again, it's the Inquisition, so you wouldn't necessarily know. Um, but here you go. In a demon infest of a demon infested mining facility, the Grey Knights find themselves surrounded by slavering warp monsters. The banner must not fall into the hands of such deviant creatures. So, got a nice little story there about the Grey Knights. <sighs> Giving you some background as to who they are and what they are. Um, they're basically, before the Primaris came around, these guys were considered the Marine Marines. Yeah, they got all the best armor, they did all the best Terminators. You can see they got all the best cool stuff with storm bolters attached. There is some things like that. They were considered the elite of the elite of the elite of the elite. So that's uh, pretty cool. Sorry, something one other. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to our Space Marine reinforcements. Yay! <clears throat> Little assembly instructional things. Clipper safety in case someone losses an arm. Um, again, most of this stuff is fairly straightforward. Uh, if you dry fit it together beforehand, it will help avoid making mistakes because some bits kind of fit together. Um, but most bits, in fact, you will only fit together one way. Um, so if you dry fit it, you usually notice there's gaps. You go, oh, okay, this is definitely not one, not the one. Um, or you can read the instructions if you like. <laughs> I find half the fun is putting them together, working out the little puzzles. But there's instructions on how they all go together. It's all fairly straightforward. Uh, just check out the numbers and bits like that. You've got a few optional pieces. Um, you've got a few options with the pose, you know, arm up, arm down, arm up, arm, yeah, arm up, arm down, head left, head right, you know, things like that. <clears throat> so you can really kind of work out what you want <clears throat> and not have everything quite the same. Uh, some guys are um, a bit more singular pose, the banner bearer, for example. 
but even then he's you know gone down gone up and it is entirely possible uh to use a craft knife or a modeling knife to trim some of the bits and legs or to move the arms if you really want to make them different although frankly the poses are really good anyway here we're going through the paint things but they're also showing you how to paint the um <coughs> the lieutenant helmet uh sergeants get a red helmet um ancients get a white helmet as and as do veterans uh lieutenants have a blue helmet with a thick white stripe and then a thinner red stripe um indicating red through authority and white because they're veterans so it's only you know the sergeants know what they're doing you know, sorry the sergeants have that authority the veterans know what they're doing the lieutenants have authority and know what they're doing <laughs> kind of thing uh, so that's pretty cool um yep <laughs> going through here with all the painting instructions <clears throat> you know your washes your highlights if you've been following it and working through um the things by this point hopefully you'll be a reasonable painter you don't have to be good <clears throat> and you'll get something that looks something like this and is reasonably nice. Next, we've got Defend the Colours. Despite the best efforts of the Ultramarines, Kalon now crawls with Death Guard. Plague Marines march forth behind waves of pox walkers and hordes of chaos cultists. Um, the Space Marines are hemmed in on all sides, but whilst their banner still flies, they shall not retreat. So, uh, basically, a, a kind of Zuri Rocks Rift one where you're trying to defend the banner. Um, <clears throat> straight sort of straight up setting using Warzone Warmat 2 and Warmat 3. Uh, the armies you've got here are three command points each. Lord Felthius, the Tainted Cohort, seven Plague Marines, the Mophitic Blight Hall and 12 Poxwalkers, with the Space Marine Captain, the Primaris, uh, Primaris Lieutenant, uh, ten Intercessors, <clears throat> three Hellblasters, Hellblasters, the Primaris Ancient, obviously, and the Redemptor Dreadnought. Uh, so quite evenly matched there, should be quite a fun battle and um, <clears throat> should be quite enjoyable. And we've got some more rules here. Um, Primaris Ancient Rules, uh, sorry, Primaris Ancient Rules and Primaris Lieutenant Rules, and we will look up, we'll go through, quickly through those. Um, six inch movement on the Lieutenant as you'd expect. Weapon skill two plus BS three plus. So uh, standard ballistic skill, but a little better in close combat if you want to get there. <clears throat> and the Lieutenant will be slightly better armed, so why not? Uh, strength and toughness four, wounds five, which isn't bad at all. Got some survivability there. Uh, four attacks, again, not not a bad number of attacks. Uh, in combination with that weapon skill two, you should get a couple of hits through there. Leadership nine, uh, because obviously you can, they can work with his leadership, and a three plus save as standard armor. This uh, unit contains one primary lieutenant. It can include one additional primary lieutenant with a power rating of five uh, plus five. Each model is armed with a master crafted auto bolt rifle. A bolt pistol, frag grenades, and crack grenades. Those are your standard armaments. <coughs> uh, bolt pistol, we know, is 12 inches, pistol 1, strength 4, AP 0, and D1. The master crafted auto bolt, auto bolt rifle um, is uh, salt 2, same as a standard auto bolt rifle, same range 24, strength 4, AP 0, damage 2. So that's two shots, four damage. That's two shots, two damage each, giving you four damage in total. If you hit and wound on all of them, uh, power sword, um, user strength, AP minus three. So that's a marine killer there. Um, with one damage, you're talking again a potential of taking four wounds off of something, and you're going to avoid armor saves for the most part. You've got frag and crack grenades, which we're familiar with, uh, range six, um, grenade D6, uh, strength three for the frag, damage one, and the crack, range six, grenade one. Uh, strength 6, AP minus 1, D3 wound damage. So again, we're familiar with that one. One is a one is there to take out units. The other is there to try and take out vehicles and elites. <laughs> Codex Discipline. Models in this unit can still shoot in the turn in which they fall back. But if they do so much track, they must subtract one for their hit roll in the shooting phase, which we know. Tactical Precision. And this is the more interesting stuff. I was talking about Extraordinary Forces. You can... Reroll wound rolls of one for friendly ultramarine units that are within six inches of this lieutenant. Um, so there's there's a good reason to keep them close to but behind uh, your standard marine units because it lets you get better rolls. Um, and the Shinano Fear, reroll morale test for this unit. Company heroes, during deployment, all models in this unit must be set up at the same time, though they do not need to be set up in unit coherency. From that point onwards, each primary lieutenant is treated as a separate unit. 
Um, that's to stop people just going, okay, I'm going to put one guy out. Because you take turns. Okay, I'm going to put one guy out, you put a unit out. I'm going to put another guy out, you put a unit out. I'm going to put another guy out, you put a unit out. Now, you've put all your units out, and I can react by using individual guys. Um, by by keeping them together, they're sort of reducing that a little bit and stopping people just trying to take a ton of individual units and use that to just see how the enemy's going to set up before setting up their main, the main bulk of their forces. You can still... Uh, do it to a certain extent, but in all fairness, they're not that cheap. And if you're sticking your primarily lieutenants out in silly places, they're going to get killed and you're not going to be able to use them. So <clears throat> there you go. Um, Primaris Ancients, um, again, movement six, which is just standard in infantry movement. Uh, weapon skill three, ballista skill three, uh, strength and toughness four, wounds five, attacks four, leadership nine, as you'd expect, and uh, three plus save, as you'd expect. Uh, Primaris is a single model with a bolt rifle, bolt pistol, frag grenade, and crag grenade. Um, so all these guys are going to follow the standard single model rules, which is, you know, if they're, if they're not the closest guy, if there's a unit closer, they can avoid getting shot, which makes them survival. Otherwise, you better pick them off. Um, again, in, in, in 8th edition, in six, sorry, yeah, in 8th edition, you don't have the independent characters rules that you've had up until 8th edition. They, um, they've done that for simplicity. It used to be the... You could put characters in with units, and then you have things like lookout sir rules and things like that, which would keep the characters protected. By having them out of the units and just going, you can't shoot at them unless they're the closest thing, they just removed that and uh, streamlined it a bit to try and keep the games a bit quicker and a bit more flowy. Because it used to be, I'm going to aim for the character, okay, I'm going to throw a guy in front of him. Um, there's a two up roll to see if that guy jumps in front of the bullet. Then there's an armor save, it added a whole extra things. And all these little extra things just usually make the game take longer and longer and longer. It's weird because 40k really started off as what we would consider today a skirmish game with small amounts of troops. And as they've expanded to larger sizes, they've had to drop out rules and uh, change things to make things smoother. But, um, you know, in my opinion, up to 7th Ed, I think they cut about they cut back too much. Or, or sometimes they cut back the wrong rules. So they've reintroduced some important rules and they've taken others out to try and maintain streamlining and give people what they want. Um, for example, in 7th Ed, all movement was 6 inches, no matter what you were, which to a lot of us made no sense. And then, you know, some guys would get to get to run and do other things, but it really didn't reflect the difference in a lot of the units. And you'd be surprised how important movement actually is to how a unit functions. Anyway, um, <clears throat> back to Primaris Ancient. We've got the bolt pistol, the bolt rifle, the frag grenade and the crack grenade. Um, all pretty much the same as... You'd expect, I've read out all those just now, except the bolt rifle, which is 30 inches, a bit of extra range. Uh, rapid fire, one strength, four, minus one AP, and uh, one damage, which most of us are familiar with. Uh, they shall know no fear, which I've just read out. Codex Discipline, which I've just read out. Uh, the different rules we've got are Astartes Banner, Ultramarines. Now, this one says Ultramarines. Obviously, if you're running these guys as a different chapter, you just replace the keyword there with whatever chapter you're using it for. Um, units within six of any friendly unit of the Ultramarine Ancients add one to their leadership. In addition, roll a d6 each time a mol uh, an I'll try again. each time an Ultramarine's infantry model is destroyed within six of any friendly Ultramarine's Ancients. Before removing the model to casualty, on a four plus, that model musters one last surge of strength before succumbing to its wounds and can either shoot with one of his weapons as if it were in the shooting phase, or make a single attack as if it were in the fight phase. So if you're within six inches of the banner and you die, you can hit one last time, which is really cool. I've seen people put them at the back with heavy weapon squads and get that extra hit before them dies. I've seen people put them at the front with assault squads um, and throw assault squads gleefully into superior enemies, just knowing that you know they're going to hit then they're going to die, and as they die, they're going to hit again. And just devastating units bigger than themselves by virtue of having extra attacks as they die, which is which is pretty cool and pretty powerful. Okay. Um, these guys have all the keywords we'd expect. Um, the faction keywords for both of them are Imperius, uh, sorry, Imperium, Adeptus, Astartes, and Ultramarines. Um, the Lieutenant has Character, Infantry, Primaris, and Lieutenant keywords. The Ancient has... Character, infantry, primaris, and ancient keywords, which is pretty much, yeah, which is what you're going to get. So we can see there that both of those guys 
if used properly, are going to give you extra stuff. Um, if you're using, if you're using lieutenant, you've got uh, leadership nine near a near an ancient that takes on to leadership ten. So you can roll on leadership ten with a reroll. So guys aren't going to go many places. Yeah, and that'll help keep a lot of your guys alive by uh, by holding the line there. And if they die, you get to kill with them. So it's all really quite cool stuff. Um, again, that single sided, we can see there's a little bit of a of poking from being near the plastic, but not so much as I think any of us are going to actually care. Standard guidance there. You know, it's like, um, get help or guidance from our friendly whammer stuff. Uh, if your store's anything like my store, the which is the one in Portsmouth, uh, the staff are genuinely friendly and nice guys. Um, they'll always try and help you if they can, um, or they'll give you, give you, um, your space in most of the good stores. Some of the stores you can go, do you need any help? Do you need any help? Do you need any help? Most of the stores are manned by guys who are effectively veterans of the gaming scene. So they'll check, they'll ask, and then if you want them to let you do your thing, they will. Um, GW did get a reputation for pushing these guys to continuously ask people if they needed help and be very proactive in their selling. Most of the guys working for GW now are aware how annoying and off-putting that can be and actually have worked it into their sales pattern. So they'll... They do an appropriate level of asking, but they're not on your back all the time. Um, at least that's the way it's working in my local store. You know, they ask at an appropriate level, and then they let you they let you go to it, and then come back only come back over and help you if you know if it looks like you need help, or you're lost, or you're confused. Uh, plus, they'll always chat to you about gaming because they're nice. Okay, um, next issue. <clears throat> next issue, we have paints. We have two new paints. So I hope we get something else for that issue. Otherwise, um, for two seventy-five each, we're going to be losing a little money on the issue. Um, the paints are Thousand Sun Blue and Temple Guard Blue. So there's some new highlighting. Um, there's some new paints that are going to be used for highlighting layers and things like that. Uh, Thousand Suns is a base. Uh, Temple Guard is a layer. I think it's the bases are a little thicker because they're meant to be watered down a little more. Um, is the main difference. Whereas layers. Um, you, yes, you wore them down, but you primarily tend to use them neat because you're adding little bits and pieces. Following that, a Space Marine attack bike. That's another one that I'm not going to be able to use, so that's another one that will go out um, on the uh, go out as a prize. Um, oh, that reminds me. Well, I'm just going to disappear off screen for a second. Oh, give me back. Give me that. Give me <laughs> These were. One a couple of episodes back by um, one of you guys who left a comment. Unfortunately, it's been a couple of weeks now and you haven't responded, mate. Dead sorry. Um, I did poke you a couple of times in the hopes that you wanted them. I'm just going to assume that for whatever reason, you don't need them. Perhaps you don't collect Marines. Uh, perhaps bikers aren't of interest to you. But, you know, um, so these are going to go back up for, for winning. So make a comment on the bottom of this video. And I'll randomly select you, at, select you, and next week you will get uh, three bikers. Um, I'm not going to wait until the uh, the attack bike comes in. I'm going to do that as a separate thing because I like to share prizes out. Okay, hope you guys enjoyed that video. Um, it was a day late. I do apologise. Um, that was down to the fact that I'm again changing jobs, or in this case, getting a better job. Um, I've been asked to. St I, was working agency as an agency carer and moving around, but the place I'm working at now like me and have asked me to stay on permanently, so yay for me. But it did mean me running around doing things and me getting some prep done for that. Um, so this is a, a little bit later than it would usually be. I'm recording this on Thursday morning when I would usually do it on Wednesday night. Okay, um, yeah, so sorry for the delay there. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you guys next week when we will be talking about, let's have a look at this. Raven Guard, Legions of Zench, and Painting Plasma Effects, all very cool. And then in two weeks, we are getting Space Marine Attack Bike, Discover the Tower Empire, and the history of the Raven Guard. So more cool stuff there. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, this, this one's timing perfectly with the fact that the Raven Guard have just had a bunch of extra stuff released with their emo hairdos and things like that. Seriously, have a look at them. It's like this... It, it's like My Chemical Romance became Space Marines. Uh, oh, yeah, something I didn't notice. <laughs> new battle mat, spaceport zone. So in two weeks' time, we'll be getting a new battle mat, which will be cool, and we'll hopefully uh, keep the gaming industry by changing the terrain. And again, 
Hope you guys enjoyed this and see you next week. Bye. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that video. And if you did, remember to like and subscribe to my channel. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I'm not sure why, but I am. Um, so if you like it, see me there. And uh, please tell your friends. Thanks very much. Bye.